Welcome to the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County Primary Candidate Forum for Clover Park School Directors for District 3 and 4. I am Lydia Zapetta, the moderator, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our community sponsors, I welcome the candidates and the audience to this Community Candidate Forum. The League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County acknowledges that we gather on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, surrounded by their traditional waters in the shadow of Mount Tahoma. We actively seek inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and current realities. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 100 years has been to empower informed and active participation of citizens in government. Candidate forums are one of the many ways that we do this. Anyone who's 16 years or older can be a member of the League of Women Voters. For more information on membership, go to our website at www.tacomapiercelwv.org. That's www.tacomapiercelwv.org. Org. Um, the candidates in ballot order for District 3 are Alyssa Anderson Pearson and Jeff Brown, and for District 4 are Marty Schaefer and David G. Anderson. This year's general election is on November 2nd, and you should receive your ballot by October 18th if you're a registered voter. If you're not registered or have moved, you may register at votewa.gov, that's votewa.gov, by October 25th. Your ballot must be postmarked or placed in a ballot drop box by 8 p.m. on November 2nd. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on the League of Women Voters website. Again, that is www.tacomapiercelwv.org. Questions have been prepared by our members of the League of Women Voters and our co-sponsoring organizations. We invite live audience questions at 253-906-4734. That's 253-906-4734. Questions must be directed to all candidates and may be reworded or consolidated. Our timekeeper today is Terry Baker of the League of Women Voters. She will hold up cards to let candidates know that they have 60 seconds remaining, 30 seconds, 15, and when it's time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so that you can see me and the timekeeper, Terry Baker. Please do not talk unless it's your turn. Please mute yourself um, when, you're not, when it's not your turn to speak. The audience is on mute and cannot use the chat function. A reminder that civility is expected and that, we, um, that you agree to the ground rules. Um, which among other things um, means that you will address issues and not make personal attacks. If you agree with the ground rules, please confirm by putting your thumbs up. Thank you everyone, much appreciated. Each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. After that, the order of questions will rotate and each candidate will be asked the same question. At, at the end, each candidate can make a one minute closing statement. The order of the opening two minute statements is in ballot order. So we'll start with Alyssa Anderson Pearson, then Jeff Brown, then Marty Schaefer, then David G. Anderson. Alyssa, your two minute statement, please. Hello, I'm Alyssa Anderson Pearson and I'm running for re-election to the Clover Park School Board. I have been honored to serve on the board for the past four years. I was born and raised in Lakewood. And after earning my MBA, I moved back home with my my husband and we planted our roots in the same community I grew up in and love. I have a unique voice on the board. I'm an employed mother of two young children. A parent's voice on the board is extremely important and I am the only board member and candidate with young children. I am able to look with young children. I'm able to look at issues through the various lenses and can relate to both parents and staff. During my time on the board, we have implemented sound fiscal policies, which served us well during the COVID-19 pandemic. We issued laptops for remote learning and provided Wi-Fi access to those in need. We also completed construction of our state-of-the-art Thomas Middle School without additional borrowing. While dealing with the challenges that come along with the global pandemic, we also remained focused on our journey to create a new equity and inclusion policy. I am happy to say earlier this month, the policy passed. It will ensure each of our students have the opportunity to thrive in school. Unfortunately, members of the community with extreme political viewpoints have labeled anything to do with the 
with equity, the critical race theory. This is absolutely false and being used as a manipulation tactic to receive votes. It's unfortunate that this highly political deception has become a subject of debate. This distracts from focusing on educating our children. CPSD encompasses, encompasses Lakewood and JBLM, two of the most demographically diverse communities in the state. If we fail to recognize that people come from different backgrounds and cultures, we can't be effective in helping them reach their full potential. Statistics and test scores are critical to understanding where we stand as a district and how our students are performing. As a board member, it is my goal to find ways to improve our numbers while remembering student success does not look the same for each child. My voice is valuable in the boardroom. I am reasonable and fair and have the best interest of all our children in mind when making decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Brown, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown, and um, um, I've been married for 44 years, and I've lived in the city of Lakewood for 36 years. Uh, we've raised three kids in Lakewood. We have um, two of the graduated from Lakes High School, and have been involved with John Dower School and, and Idlewild Elementary School. Um, I have eight grandchildren, and, and I'm deep, I deeply care about them, and I care about the education of all children in Clover Park Schools. I've been a practicing architect for 44 years and have served our community on nine major boards, including serving on the Lakewood Planning Advisory Board for eight years and the Pierce County Planning Commission for eight years as well. Um, I am running because I believe all families in Lakewood need a local school board to represent them by listening, learning, and acting upon what they need in our school system. I believe Clover Park Schools is, a char is chartered to impart fundamental education for our children, preparing them with life skills of reading, writing, mathematics, and physical science. I believe Clover Park Schools should, be, should reflect and reinforce the familial values of love, respect, integrity, and positive self-esteem. I believe in the outcomes of, of a fun, of, I believe in uh, outcomes-based fundamental education with instruction in speaking, writing, listening, understanding, analyzing, innovating, uh, communicating, and debating. I believe in the protecting of our schools from special interest narratives, which may distract um, our focus from the fundamental education that we pursue. And I believe that the school, should, school board should welcome and creatively seek the voices of parents in every possible way. I desire uh, with, with um, everything that I have right now to be on the school board to help us go in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marty Schaefer, please. Marty, you're on mute. What a rookie mistake, sorry. My name is Marty Schaefer and I've been on the uh, Clover Park School Board of Directors for 16 years. And in that time, it's been fascinating to see the growth. When I first got on the board, we were in the 60 percentile of percentage for graduation. We're now in the upper 80s. We've made so much progress. We've built 12 new schools, half of which, and Alyssa referred to this, half of which uh, were done through the financial stewardship of not even really needing to go out and borrow money from our um, constituents. But I just want you to know the most, I think, you know, I agree with the things that have already been said. What's significant? about who I am and what I stand for is I'm an advocate for public education. I genuinely believe that education is one of the uh, best ways to set students up for success. So that's what we've been committed to. And I also acknowledge that my, I have a wife and three daughters. Uh, my wife and two of my daughters are teachers in the school district. We have poured out a lot of heart to be able to see the growth in our community in uh, the schools and outside as well. What I think is significant about the course that we're on, that right now with the uncertainties of the pandemic, the civil unrest, the racial tensions, the things that we're just facing as a community, it's never been more important to invest in students. And I just want the people that are watching tonight to know that my constituents are students, that they are so important to me and that their voice matters and they don't even get to vote, but I do represent what's in the best interest of students every time. We've created voice and opportunities for transparency to make sure that each and every group, including student voice is heard. So that's our commitment. Um, and again, I think that one of the things that might be important to understand 
is that we really have listened to each and every student as well as each and every voice. We can't always do what everybody wants. And sometimes voices are louder than others, but we do listen to each. Thank you. Um, David Anderson. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, my wife and I recently celebrated our 49th anniversary. I was out uh, doorbelling uh, now over 4,000 homes. And so we agreed that we would celebrate after the election, November 2nd. Uh, we have four grown children, all of whom have or currently are professionally involved in the lives of children or have volunteered in the lives of youth. We have 10 grandchildren, four of which are in the uh, Culver Park School District. The others are homeschooled. All of our grown children uh, have worked with youth and uh, have grown up in this uh, liquid area like I have all my life. I attended Telecom Elementary School, uh, graduated from Woodbutt Middle School, Lakes High School in 1968. Um, I'm the Neighborhood Association President of Telecom in Woodbrook the last 15 years owner of Bill's Boathouse since 2004, a fishing resort. I have been the chaplain with the Tacoma and Lakewood Police Department, graduated from Northwest Baptist Seminary in 1987, having previously pastored a church on Ruby Island from 1993 to 1996. I've had a number of interim pastor works. Um, one of my favorite uh, claims to fame is that uh, we sponsored over several years the Telecom Elementary School baseball team uh, from the Pony League, Protect Our Nation's Youth. I've mentored children uh, by way of communities in schools Lakewood and through AmeriCorps. I'm currently a Good News Club teacher of teachers and a club leader. I put the, with a team of folks, put the first ever initiative in the city's history on the ballot, having won the right to initiative and referendum. And then I'm a frequent con contributor to the Suburban Times, the Lakewood KBLM patch, and social media informing residents on matters of community concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, now we come to the questions. Each candidate gets up to 90 seconds to answer each question. For some questions, I will indicate you only have 60 seconds. Again, the live audience can text questions to 253 906 4734. That's 253 906 4734. I believe someone is not muted. If you could please mute yourself, I think we're getting background feed. Okay. The candidate order will rotate with each question. So for question one, we'll start with Jeff Brown. So first question, um, how can the district help disadvantaged students take, make up for lost instructional time? How can the district help specifically disadvantaged students make up for lost instructional time? Jeff Brown, please, 90 seconds. You're on mute. Go. Okay, thank you for that question. I appreciate that that topic. Um, we have, uh, as Alyssa had pointed out, a very diverse uh, district, probably one of the most diverse in the state. And uh, subsequently, we also have many different language groups and, um, um, you know, really families with cultural exposure. So we do have some disadvantages. Um, I think what we uh, as a district have been doing and need to do more of would be uh, accessing our community assets and, um, and understanding how we can actually connect those families that have the needs to, to the, those resources. Uh, one of the most fundamental things I believe about education is, is, the, is the involvement with parents. And I think that um, um, if you look at some of, the, some of the, the information from the OSPI about demographics and, and, and really student performance in Culver Park schools, you'll see that the Asian community happens to be um, one of the highest. And um, even though they have a diverse um, origin, uh, somehow they seem to succeed in, in, in overcoming um, that, that diversity challenge. So um, what I believe is, is probably most fundamental is that we focus on the parents and equipping the parents and helping their kids. And we find various different community assets to do that. 
And uh, that's really going to be our key. It's really going to be all around parents and helping parents teach kids. Thank you, Marty. Well, first of all, you have to see the individuals and, and be aware that in, individuals really do have advantages and disadvantages. And so seeing, seeing and hearing their story and entering into their life is mission critical and being able to uh, be a part of empowering them to move forward in education, believing in them. In terms of being able to uh, basically accelerate education in some of the areas where we've all as a nation lost because of the global pandemic, the best way to accelerate student education is always through engagement. The higher the level of engagement, the more uh, a student's gonna be uh, set up to learn. And so we have done so much as a district to increase the ability for a student to be engaged. We, first of all, we started by uh, making sure that our teachers are taken care of, that there's a wellness factor, that we have SEL programs uh, for the students in the classroom to be able to be incorporated into the life of what's going on in the everyday of teaching. And we've also uh, made sure that, um, you know, kind of to just point, I mean, we have done what he just said. We made sure that there were, uh, there's a computer for each and every child, that they had Wi-Fi, that they had access. And so you've got to see it, you've got to roll up your sleeves. And it's, it's not just going to a, the community, but it's flexing and leveraging the resources that we have as an institution uh, and being able to make sure that we set them up in such a way that a student can utilize them. Thank you, David. Okay, if I understood the question, this is to um, help the students, uh, disadvantaged students, um, through the uh, setback from COVID, correct? If I heard the question. Um, the question is, how can the district help disadvantaged students make up for lost instructional time? Okay, super. Um, well, first of all, uh, disadvantaged students are in the same category as all individual students. And so every single individual student uh, needs to be treated for the um, individual student that they are. So you know, if they're lacking at any point for any reason, um, it is the uh, tracking team of comprised of teachers, parents, and uh, the student to determine uh, what it is that is lacking. If it's credit recovery, then additional classes offered online or in blended environments. Students not re completing the required number of courses each year are put on a plan featuring virtual classes, self-paced online instruction to help students earn credits and stay on track for graduation. Scheduling remediation and makeup options for struggling students during the school day, after the school day, free tutoring and peer mentoring uh, I think would address um, students that are otherwise liable to fall through the cracks of academic success. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, the Clover Park School District has definitely done a lot to try to help all students, especially those that are disadvantaged. There's no secret that the pandemic created an even a, a gap um, due to just individual dynamics. And some of the things that we're doing, we have 24 seven tutors available um, for each student so they can get extra help with classwork. We had summer programs that allowed for credit retrieval and we'll continue um, on with that. Um, we have learning packets available. Um, we do have many community resources. Our superintendent, uh, Mr. Banner, is amazing at creating new partnership as well as fostering existing relationships. One, for example, is caring for kids. Um, they, but prior to school starting, they had a bunch of school supplies, clothes. They really got students um, ready to on the first day of class. Um, 
which was it's amazing. It's a wonderful partnership. Um, and as Marty said, we're really focused on social and emotional learning since we know the pandemic took a huge toll on both staff and students. Um, but for students, we have counseling available. Um, we're really focusing on that. We, we are working as hard and fast as we can to get students back up to speed for, uh, to make up for lost time. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to repeat the number um, is 253-906-4734 for anybody who wants to send questions. Actually, this next question is coming from a student. It's somewhat of a variation. Well, it's, it's sort of on the other extreme, um, but a similar question. Students complain that because they are behind, they're being taught last year's curriculum. Is there any way to speed up the curriculum to catch up on material? And we'll start with Marty this time. The last year's material, so it would just depend on what grade level and where you're at. So that may be accurate in some situations and not in others. But the opportunity for a student to learn at different paces is certainly there. And there's also always the ability to uh, connect with uh, teachers and and I mean there's just there I know there are a lot of opportunities to fast track as well and so we've kept the virtual we've kept the online we have uh, several LA, ALE type opportunities as well for schools so sad anyway I apologize for that uh, the um uh, the answer is yes, you can accelerate the learning. There is pacing and there is an opportunity. We have tour, we have tutors, we have peer-to-peer, -peer, we have gear up. There's a lot of opportunities for a student to expedite their learning. Thank you, David. Well, excellent question from a, a student who would like to advance quicker than um, perhaps the uh, COVID curriculum uh, currently allows. Uh, anytime a student uh, has a question about how to um, be um, approved, for example, to uh, bypass uh, student opportunities that he's had to learn that he's already accomplished, that uh, that is a credit to his uh, career objectives in that if, if a student can access advanced academic opportunities without teacher recommendation, without uh, even having met a GPA requirement, but can um, uh, pursue at his own initiative uh, advanced um, opportunities to uh, be involved in the classes that uh, he figures with his tracking team is going to put him either back on pace or in an advanced um, mechanism to achieve uh, his educational goals. That, that should always be uh, on the uh, forefront of a teacher's um, concern that students uh, are able to meet and then exceed uh, any of the standards that uh, the class has and, and go beyond. Thank you, Alyssa. All right, thank you. Um, it is a great question. It's important to remember that uh, school board directors don't control the pace of the curriculum in the classroom. However, it is a you know it is important that we're not holding students back. I personally haven't heard of um, the curriculum. Uh, being pushed back because of the pandemic. However, I do know that teachers are aware that um, there is a learning gap because of the pandemic. Um, so that's definitely something to look into. Uh, I know that teachers allow for different pacing for individual students. Um, so, you know, while we're not in the classrooms with the teachers, I would hope that that is the case for every, um, every classroom. But I know that the uh, that teachers want to make sure that they're meeting their individual students' needs. Um, so uh, there are opportunities and we should continue to make more opportunities to allow students to excel and achieve their goals. 
Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would like to applaud that student for asking the question. I don't think there's a lot of students that would ask that. And probably as I look back to my um, you know, junior high and high school background, I wouldn't have been that person. Um, there's a quote I really like uh, by W.B. Yeats called, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of the fire. And this student has got the fire. And I have to say that um, I'd sure want to make sure that that student gets every opportunity that, that he or she can to um, absorb what they may have missed, which I don't know that they did, but if they did, then they could absorb that. And there's some interesting things. I mean, with COVID, I'm not, again, I don't know what's actually occurred with the, with, with the um, education and what may have been delayed, but I know math is a linear topic. You don't go to algebra one, to algebra two, unless you go to algebra one and and certain things are sequential, even in the sciences. So um, I would hope that um, that the uh, the district would be ahead of that already, and that the student wouldn't have to feel like they're behind, and that um, there would be a way to even um, accelerate. Like Alyssa was saying, that the district has a 24/7 tutor tutoring available, and um, if that's the case, then I think we should be able to access that for any student and help them move along quickly. Uh, so once again, I applaud that student. I think it's phenomenal. I hope there's many more like them. And I'd like to just say, let's keep lighting the fires for these kids. Thank you. Next question, and we'll start with um, David on this question. How should curriculum be designed to educate students about past and present injustices while still inspiring pride in our history? How should the curriculum be designed to educate students about past and present injustices while still inspiring pride in our history? David, please. Uh, for some reason, I trailed off at the end of the question. How, how should curriculum be designed to, to do what exactly? To educate students about past and present injustices while inspiring pride in our history. Well, I believe that parents uh, have the um, responsibility and the privilege of, re of reviewing all curriculum. Uh, children, of course, are not wards of the state. Uh, they are loaned to public education where public education is public. That is, it's the ownership of the parent. So uh, I would be in favor of uh, curriculum career uh, review committees uh, staffed by uh, parents. Parents are able to examine the classroom curriculum, teacher trainings, teacher contracts, uh, even school budgets. Uh, the curriculum that identifies uh, historical uh, civics type um, matters or any other curriculum in the school district uh, should be the purview of the parents uh, who should not have to, to navigate a difficult path by which to determine what is taught to their kids in the classroom. So I believe the real stakeholder groups uh, that have, uh, should have the view and the final say uh, in, in, in partnership with the teachers uh, should be the parents. So uh, I would be an uh, advocate for um, debate presentations even on any subject that should uh, come before the uh, school staff. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa. Yeah. Um, for curriculum, I am for having accurate curriculum, but uh, history curriculum specifically, I would say probably for this question. Um, and also, um, I know it was mentioned about parent input. We do allow for that now. Um, our core curriculum is approved by the board. There is a committee and parents, staff, other teachers, any member of the community is welcome to come review the core curriculum and state their concerns state their support for it. Um, so we do have that um, already. And for 
we do have a policy on teaching uh, controversial topics and teachers are required to state both sides of an issue. Um, they are not allowed to just have one side and move forward with that. And so I know that that is a, has been brought up multiple times up at this point and we do have a policy on that. So um, we'll keep that implemented and hopefully in the future when we do um, go to approve new curriculum. We have a greater support from the community for coming to review it. Um, the word does get out, but it's not the most exciting topic. So sometimes we don't um, don't get a huge turnout. Thank you, Jeff. Unmute. OK, yeah, thank you for the question. It's an interesting one. It's a difficult one because it's slightly cryptic. And um, I think we're all aware that there's certain topics out there that are under debate as to you know, what may be accurate or inaccurate history uh, re respective to justice or injustice. And so um, I like what Alyssa said about the fact that um, teachers are in instructed and perhaps encouraged, of course, to, to uh, present both sides and, and, and objectively so on, on things like that. But uh, just putting that aside and saying, let's say that, that, and we know there are certain topics where there's been injustice, you could take the Japanese internment, for instance, would be uh, uh, one of those topics. If you were a, a Japanese student, you would feel perhaps that you were um, a part of something that shouldn't have happened and that maybe you're a victim of that. And I think that's an opportunity for the school district. And um, what I'd like to say here is that there's a quote that I like, and that's, um, Basically, the whole purpose of education is turning is to turn mirrors into windows. And sometimes we look at those mirrors and we, we kind of become ingrown. And that would be the case with, with looking at a, an injustice in your background. And how do we turn that into a, a window where we can see possibilities in the future? So um, I would like to think that, that all teachers and all, uh, even of course, parents and everybody involved in a student's education would help prepare them to basically acknowledges the difficulties in life and kind of learning how to overcome them. That's it. Thank you. Marty. First of all, it's really helpful. It is a great question because uh, it gets down to the, the foundation of the philosophy of what we're doing as educators. And so it's not about debate, folks. It's about collaborating. It's not about getting your point across. It's about facilitating a conversation where we can learn and grow together. And so that's imperative. And it's not just one side or the other side. And in our policies on controversy, it's not, hey, we want to make sure that there's uh, an even amount of information being set out. It's about, no, we want to make sure that there's very real conversation. And things like Juneteenth, where people in the state of Texas were informed almost a year after the Civil War was over, that really did happen. And those things aren't being taught. So there are injustices. And so it's time for us to acknowledge the reality of injustices. I'm thankful uh, to you, uh, League of Women Voters, for starting off with discussing the reality of the fact that the land that we're standing on right now was native land. And we, it's right to acknowledge that. It's right to be aware of it and maybe even have some empathy to where we move to better understanding how that has affected those individuals then and how it impacts us today. And so it's not just a mirror or a window, it's both and. It's understanding, leaning into, and growing from those experiences. And when a person feels heard, when a person feels understood, that's when we get to learn from them. So communication is giving others a platform to share and speak. And if we were great listeners instead of debaters, we'd probably be a lot better educators. Thank you. Um, the next question, we will start with Alyssa. And it's a 60 second question. Um, all Clover Park employees, including contractors, must be vaccinated by October 18th, 2021, unless they have religious or medical exemption. Should the school district also require all students 12 and over to be vaccinated? And if so, why when? Alyssa, 60 second. Okay, this is a great question and one that definitely has been brought up. Um, I will start out by saying I'm very pro vaccines. I, you know, vaccinate my children. And I think it's important. However, that being said, I am not at the point in time where I am ready to put the mandate on 
children. I would like to see all of the vaccine options be approved before we put that into place so parents feel more comfortable. You know, I know as a parent myself, I'm more comfortable get, getting it first. And then, you know, when it's available to my children, then we'll make that decision when it comes. But I would say I'm not ready yet. I would like to wait for approval and then I will um, make a decision then. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, that's definitely a, a current topic. So thank you for asking the question. Um, you know, um, it's, it's, um, it is controversial. There's, if you just read the news, there's, there's the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers and people are categorized that way. I think that's unfortunate. I think that the approach that we should all be looking at is just, you know, what's really best for an individual. And of course, as a whole too, but the science has been all over the board. And I don't believe the district really has the authority to mandate one or another. I believe that certainly we've seen that from the state. And um, if something comes down from the state, we have to honor the laws that we have. Um, then it would come down to whether or not we, we were, we're, reg we're, we're enforcing those in the way that, that you know, um, they would be in, could be enforced. Um, with regards to kids being vaccinated, I don't think that that's something that, again, we should weigh into um, as, as a district. That's not our responsibility. We're not healthcare experts, nor should we even disseminate what's going on. Thank you. Marty. Yes, it's true that the school district is in a position of following the uh, laws of the state, and we uh, are in this very difficult maze of trying to then create uh, structures for those things to be uh, followed through. And so I personally, in this situation, think that it's right for us uh, to be open as we have been even with the um, teachers vaccination. So they're required, teachers are required to be vaccinated by October 18th. And if they're not, then they have an opportunity to explain why they're not. And I would think that the same uh, truth should be given or the same opportunity should be given to families uh, or children to be able to, if they're not going to get vaccinated, then they need to explain or why that is. And then I think also, I just want everybody to know that our school district has done an amazing job of creating virtual opportunities. So if a student did not want to get vaccinated, he or she is able to have a quality education virtually. So we've done that for you. Thank you, David. Yes, uh, I would agree with Marty in that respect that uh, quality education for our students is paramount in everything we do. If we um, are faced with the uh, decision to uh, mandate children uh, vaccinated, uh, as we have been uh, have had our hand forced by uh, the mandate for teachers, uh, it is not, in my opinion the school board's position to be the enforcers. Um, for, for example, a teacher to lose his job because of uh, a religious re exemption that was um, denied uh, and to meet a deadline uh, under uh, safety guidelines, then I think in the interest of education, as Marty also said, it's not one side, it's not the other side, but this does need debate. Uh, informed debate, uh, that is part of education, uh, even more than listening, uh, as, as important as listening, is that we need to come to the table with both sides medically. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, the, the next question is an audience question, and we'll start with Jeff, and then Marty, then David and Alyssa. Um, so the audience question is, would you consider placing, in addition to counselors, social workers in each school to facilitate that um, family connection to the classroom and the need and the needed services for each family. So would you consider placing in addition to counselors, social workers in each school to facilitate family connection to the classroom and the needed services to each family? And we're starting with Jeff. Okay, thank you for the question. That's uh, unique. I would not have anticipated that, but I appreciate it. Um, just off the top, I believe that um, I, well, let me say this. I don't believe that, that in, inviting outside groups to the schools is a good idea. 
I think that we need to remain in a position to where we refer to perhaps some of those same groups, but I do not think uh, there's a place for groups to actually come into the school and participate in the education process. I think that would tend to distract from the mission that we have, and that's really educating our kids in the fundamentals of our education. So um, the answer would be not open to it. Thank you, Marty. Well, I would uh, politely disagree with Jeff. Uh, Social emotional learning is incredible. It's important to set students up for success. If you listen to corporate America right now, the number one thing that they're looking for in a student that graduates from school is what's called life skills, soft, the soft skills, the ability to connect with other people, the ability to be a collaborative problem solver. And so SEL is important. We already have social workers in the schools. I just want you to understand that we have uh, police officers in our school. They're not there just policing. They're they're building relationships with the students. We also have paras. We have community in schools. Uh, we have the Boys and Girls Clubs and other partnerships. We have Gear Up. We have a lot of individuals that are coming in to solidify and reinforce the things in the life of a student. But that, that's just one piece of it. We have a very holistic approach. We also have peer-to-peer -peer support. We also have things that we do with families. We have things that we do with, to honor different cultures. And so having the influence and the partnerships of our community represented in our schools is a great way to connect with people. So if I'm a, if I'm a young person and there's other people that I can see and connect with that help me understand how to live it, not just in the school, but in my community, I think that's a great asset. And so we've done a lot of that uh, and it's been to the direct benefit of students. And so, yes, let's, let's have social uh, impact in the school and, and also make sure our students are impacting society out of it. Thank you. David Anderson. I'm quoting from the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, 2009-2015, who said, we often talk about parents being partners in education. When we say that, we're usually talking about healthy and productive relationships that can develop between adults in a child's life at home or in a community and adults who work with that child at school. I can't overstate how important that partnership is. So when we're talking about um, participants in the classroom to partner with the teacher, what an outstanding uh, concept and what a relief to the teacher to have uh, a volunteer uh, community asset mapping generated uh, partner, whether communities and schools in Lakewood, uh, domestic violence program through the YWCA, um, the uh, youth organizations that specialize the Y uh, in working with youth, uh, but not to distract from the classroom setting. I mean, the teachers need to be free to do the job uh, that they were trained to do, but for someone to come alongside and facilitate, to read, to, to participate in art projects, science projects, uh, whether they're parents, ideally, or partners from the community, absolutely. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes, um, I'm, well, I'm definitely open to it. I, in my mind, I see it more like Marty had mentioned, our SEOs, where sometimes they share a school, you know, it's a central resource um, that supports multiple schools within our district. Um, it's important to remember that there are students in our district that face many challenges. They have difficult home lives. A social worker could enrich their lives. It doesn't mean you have to take the support or the support or services or help. It just means that it's available there. The resource is there. You know, the social worker can help connect them with other resources. As Marnie mentioned, we're already doing similar things to this now. We refer people out. We connect families with different resources within our community. Um, schools are the hub. So if, you know, you get the kids in, in the schools and you can get resources to them instead of going out to each individual home. So I am definitely open to it. Um, I think the more resources, the better. Um, you know, and parents, parents from who I speak to are very happy with the additional resources that are available in the district. Um, maybe they don't know they're there. And we have all these partnerships and teachers and other 
um, staff at the school can just connect them. That's usually what's necessary to help improve lives and ultimately student education when they're better supported. Thank you. Um, the next question is also an audience question. And uh, we'll start with Marty, then David, then Alyssa, and then Jeff. Um, this question is, currently our district test scores are less than 40% passing math and science and 51% passing in, um, ELA. Um, how are we graduating almost 90% of our students when we have so many failing core subjects? Marty. Yes. So the reality of it is that test scores are indicators of how well a student is navigating through our educational institution. That's what they are. Even attendance, the test scores, grade completion, uh, those are indicators, but they do not define whether or not a student is successful. And so a, a student can come in at many different entry points, friends, and they can be at a above or below level but they can move as we've proven with our ability as uh, an educational team to move them to be prepared to graduate. And what I wanna make sure that you understand when you talk about graduation rate at Cobra Park School District, we're one of the tougher school districts to graduate from in the state of Washington. And so our credit requirements are higher than our, some of our neighboring uh, districts as well. And so clearly we're teaching the right things, we're engaging them, we bring people in even though we're uh, catching people where they come in and they, there's an assessment and they may not be up to speed in that area or they may not be at grade level. We know how to move them through the right type of assessments, the right type of engagement to prepare them for uh, being successful in school. And it's evidenced by the fact that they're graduating. And one more thing, it's, it's not just graduating. We are at historic levels of scholarships for students. There's never been students being able to graduate with so much opportunity and scholarships to go on to uh, graduate uh, well, uh, graduate work. So very proud of it. Thank you, Thank you. David. Uh, I have three planks on my platform by which to address uh, academic um, failure uh, in the Florida Park School District. The first, the ABCs, is I want to advocate for listening sessions between school board directors and teachers. Uh, teachers need time to do their job. Uh, I believe that they are ad administratively top heavy, uh, required to do things that uh, are um, overburdening them from the job that they need to do. Uh, consequently, uh, we've got another need in our school board and that is to bring the B, uh, best practices of great schools in America to the table at every single school board meeting, uh, whenever it meets, uh, what great schools in America are doing to help students achieve academic success and post-secondary um, ability to meet the challenges of life after high school, those need to be discussed every single meeting to pull our school district out of the bottom third. And three, I will challenge the status quo. We need more than good listeners, we need great debaters because the issues are that important. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah, thank you. If I understood the question correctly, it was regarding our test scores and how that affects graduation rates, I believe. So I think it's important to note that test scores do not equate to graduation rates. I, I mean, they're correlated but some individuals are not the best test takers. That does not mean they won't graduate from school. There's a whole bunch of other things um, that go into test or to grades and ultimately graduation. So of course we're focused on test scores and improving those. I think it's important to mention the test scores that are mentioned are outdated because there isn't any um, Sorry, I don't know if that's me that put the feedback, but um, the test score, there aren't test scores available because of the pandemic. So we'll have to see where students are post pandemic and come up with a plan to help them continue to improve. I mean, it's not a secret that we have challenges in the district. 
but as Marty mentioned, test scores are not the definition of student success for every individual. Student success is defined differently by everyone. Me personally, test scores are important. When I was growing up, it was important I got test or high test scores. I wanted to go to college. Those were my dreams. That is not the definition of success for everyone. And we need to make sure that we help students get to where they want to be in life. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, that's an interesting question. And thank you, Lisa, for that answer. I, I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. Um, as a, not having been on the school board, it's, um, I, I go through a lot of statistics. I've looked at the OSPI sites. I've looked at, again, the past uh, ratings that we've had without the benefit of what, what, what's currently occurred. And you know, I've looked at uh, Clover Park High School, Lakes High School, and uh, William Harris Prep, and they're all different, you know, and they're pretty drastically different. You know, in Clover Park, you've got a 70% proficiency in math and in 54 in English arts or uh, English language arts uh, at, at Lakes High School is 33% uh, for math and 65 for um, English language arts. Uh, so that's curious to me. Um, and I don't know how to put those statistics together exactly. Um, I also look at the US News and World Report um, uh, publication recently where it talks about Clover Park being uh, uh, 193 in the state of Washington and 87 in the Seattle area. Um, and then, you know, we have the, again, the, the proficiency scores in math and, and, uh, and language arts that were noted, but the graduation rate being as high as it is, I think it was, I've got 74% here. I, I think that um, there's a little disconnect um, with, with that. And I think it's, that's what's difficult about metrics and trying to, to, to kind of navigate a district based upon these kinds of metrics. So I see a stop there, so I'll stop. Thank you. Um, so actually, I think we've come to our last question. Um, and this last question is, um, we'll start with David, then Alyssa, then Jeff, then Marty. What do you think Clover Park School District can do to empower kids and youth about addressing climate change, either through the school district's energy policies and purchasing, um, energy and purchasing policies and or its curriculum and activities? What do you think the Clover Park School District can do to empower kids and youth about addressing climate change, either through its energy and purchasing policies and or its curriculum and activities? David. Excellent research project for uh, a club, uh, both in school or after school to address climate change. Uh, what are the issues? What are the problems? How are we gonna fix it? And then have them make a presentation to the debate class uh, to be presented uh, by the other side that say, it's not an issue. It's not a problem. There's nothing to fix. And that to me, to generate debate clubs, which I may be present at Harrison Pratt, but I don't believe elsewhere, Clover Park High School or Lakes High School, perhaps there is, but I, I think that would be an excellent forum uh, like we're having now uh, that students themselves would do uh, the footwork uh, and then present to the student body uh, what the issues are regarding climate change. Thank you. Alyssa. And David, could you please mute yourself? Oh. So this is a great question. So I do know for purchasing for all governments, uh, uh, school districts have access to it too through the um, webs system. They do have a focus on the environment and the climate. So there are usually bonus uh, points when you're doing a proposal um, that if you um, for different environmental factors. Um, I don't disagree with students doing research and presenting it as well, but I do think the adults are responsible for um, discussing uh, climate change in classrooms as well. Um, I also think different projects, like I don't know if anyone has seen the water fountains that count how many bottles uh, were saved 
plastic bottles were saved. Um, I remember that it was implemented in my college and I've seen them elsewhere as, as well. But every time you filled up your reusable water bottle, um, it clicked, uh, you know, it went up one for uh, saving a plastic water bottle. And you could visually see the impact that you were making by bringing your own water bottle. And I do think that there's things like that that we can do for students, show them that their actions directly impact the environment. And there's fun projects that you can do, um, especially in science. So, and I know this is an ongoing issue and definitely will be a focus. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much for the question. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, it, it's, it's something that um, I think if I was to go to parents, I would find a, a kind of a spectrum of opinions about that. And again, if I, if I stick to what I really believe about Clover Park Schools, our focus really is on the, the core fundamentals of education. And I think this might be an or, something that orbits it. And I think it could fall in the category of science studies as much like what David alluded to, uh, perhaps even in the curriculum and, and really exposing climate change as a, as a science topic um, from different points of view and different, different databases, if you will. So it'd be actually an excellent way to, to explore that. But on the other side, you talked about, you know, what do we do about it? And I think that that really promotes another question. And that is, how, do, how are we good stewards of our earth? How do we actually take care of the land that we live in, the air that we breathe, the trees that we get to look at? Those are all wonderful questions and things that we should really be addressing as a whole, you know, through maybe perhaps life sciences and through maybe through um, through our social studies type courses where, we, where we're talking about citizenship and being good citizens of, of our community. So um, I believe that it's a great topic and it can be divided in many different ways. And those are some of the ways I would suggest. And I'd love to get the parents' opinion about that. Thank you, Marty. First of all, thank you so much for acknowledging the importance of empowering student voice. I just think it's so significant. And then being able to do it around a topic like climate change is really relevant to them, much more so than sometimes um, other people. They don't believe in it or see it. And so the fact that we can even have that attitude, which is, can be kind of cavalier, it's amazing to, to hear what's important to students. And so if climate change is important to them, help let's help understand their voice. Let's find out why it's important to them. What is it that we could do better? And I love tying it to our purchasing and our practices as a school district. So we know that we recycle. We know, as Alyssa alluded to, that our new buildings are very efficient, that we have effective things in place. So we're doing a part, but it would, it would be great to actually empower students to come in and do a cost benefit analysis, not a debate, not this or that. Again, it's not about debating. It's about creating voice, a space to learn. It's about collaborating. It's about being better together. That's what, that's what brings the fire to education and learning, not us saying, well, we think this and you think that, let's have a, a debate. It's about learning from each other. And so I'm just excited. I, I think there's a few topics that are more important in our environment. And so I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the perspective of the young people because they're the ones that are going to be uh, setting our environment up to either continue on its present course or to do better. Thank you. Um, now it's time for the closing statements. I'm really sorry. We had a flurry of questions coming in at the last minute, and we could probably go on for another hour at least. But unfortunately, I have another candidate forum to moderate shortly. <laughs> so um, I'm really sorry we didn't get to all the audience questions. Each candidate has up to one minute for their closing statement, and we'll change the order of the opening statements. So we'll start with Jeff, then Marty, then David, then Alyssa. So Jeff, please. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, my commitment to be on this Clover, Clover Park School Board is to put parents back in charge of children's education. I think uh, through every means possible, the out, uh, outreach um, to parents through school board, through school board meetings, through Zoom meetings, through proactive transparency, publications and things like that. Anything we can do to add to what we've already been doing would be really helpful. Um, parents are very busy. To take the politics out of education, I think a lot of candidates here talked about politics, and, and I think that is a part of what we deal with in, in our schools, and we need to make sure that we're they're really delving into the core. 
we want to improve uh, Culver Park School, School District's 35% academic standing in our in our in our in our um, state. Uh, we want. Um, I'd like to see um, supporting more t parents teaching kids through maybe home curriculums that augment what we're doing in the schools. I'd like to focus on language arts, um, math, and science. Uh, I'd like to prepare students for adult life by acknowledging the challenges that we all face throughout life, and I'd like to find employ educational solutions that actually work. Thank you. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Marty. It's never been more difficult to be in education, either as a student, a parent, or an educator or teacher right now. And that's why it's so important to have great leadership. Over the last 16 years, uh, friends, I have done everything to create a positive culture and a learning environment for each and every student. And that's why I need your vote. And I want to be very transparent, very real with you people. Uh, there are people running against me right now that are political and it's time to be nonpartisan. It's time to put the need of the student above uh, other politically charged agendas. We've done an amazing job as a district in increasing graduation rates, the IB schools, the increase in academic rigor, AP courses, career tech ed, preparing students for success in life. We've been financially one of the most stable school districts in the state of Washington. We've been able to pivot and do remarkable things through the pandemic. And we have created a strong board to listen to the community. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Lydia, Cynthia, Terry, uh, for having this forum again. In 1988, I rode 1,000 miles in my rowing single. I did that again in 1989. That seems like a lot of miles, and it is, but it's only five miles a day, five days a week, and I get two months off for the year. It paid off. In 1990, I won the Great Cross Sand Race, the largest open water rowing race in the Northwest. I was telling that to a 15-year-old as I doorbelled his house last week. He had lost apathy, direction, and purpose for his life. I said, you need to row your boat every day. We need to get back to basics in the Clover Park School District. The ABCs, the, the, the uh, elements that make for good education are individual responsibility and treating students for who they are as individuals. If we do what Amanda Ripley does, in her book, The Smartest Kids in the World, she says, teachers in countries outside the US don't use any special strategy or process. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm running for re-election to the school board because my work is not done. And I provide a unique and valuable viewpoint in the boardroom. There are always improvements to be made and I will continue to put the time and effort in because our children and the future of our community depends on it. In intense and emotional situations, I can re remain calm and listen to all sides. Our policies and procedures serve the best interest of all of our students, regardless of their background. And I always keep that in mind when making decisions. I have no political agenda. I am simply a community member and parent that wants to give back in an impactful way and improve our students' lives and community as a whole. I would be honored to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, in ballot order, the candidates for District 3 are Alyssa Anderson Pearson and Jeff Brown. Could, could someone, could everyone please mute? There's some static, sorry. In ballot order, the candidates for District 3 are Alyssa Anderson Brown and Jeff Brown, and excuse me, Alyssa Anderson Pearson and Jeff Brown, and District 4 are Marty Schaefer and David G. Anderson. You should receive your ballot by October 18th. Be sure to vote early and no later than November 2nd. I would like to thank all the candidates who participated, the Timekeeper, Terry Baker, Tacoma Pierce County League of Women Voters and our community sponsors, the Affordable Housing Consortium, Black and Indigenous Organizing, Grid City Co-op, Latinx and Unidos of South Sound, South and Neighborhood Council, Sumner Waller Community Association, the Tacoma Urban League, Vibrant Schools, and the YWCA of Pierce County. You can see other League of Women Voter candidate forums at www.tacomapierce.org. Um, 
um, read your voters pamphlet and look at vote411.org. That's vote411.org, where you can find answers to, to questions posed to all candidates running for office. Read the candidates' websites and do all that you can to be an educated voter. And please do not forget to vote by November 2nd. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you so much for being here.